It's a hot summer's day. Thousands of men have lined up and they're getting ready to charge across an open field into a strong fortified position of the Union Army. And the Confederate rebel yell is about to ring out across the fields on a hot day. Sounds a lot like Gettysburg. But in fact, it's here at Gaines Mill that that took place. As a matter of fact, it was the largest frontal assault that any army did during the entire time of the Civil War. The Confederate Army put forth 32,000 men to attack this position here at about 7 p.m. on June 27, 1862. And today we're here at Gaines Mill to talk about that battle and the men that fought that battle and how John Porter saved the United States Army from complete and total disaster by the heroics of the Union Army here at Gaines Mill. I'm here in the field where the Battle of Gaines Mill um, started, where everything began. And directly behind me, right back here, in that field somewhere, General George Pickett actually fell wounded with a bullet piercing his collarbone and breaking it. Um, there was a lot of intense fighting. There was more than 2,000 men that actually fell as casualties out here in this field behind me. And going off in that direction over there towards Boson's Creek is where the, uh, the men from the Texas Brigade actually broke through the federal lines. We're gonna take you out to the Watt House and out to the woods over there and show you some of the field and some of the acreage that's been preserved and saved by the Battlefield Trust and the National Park itself. And we will talk about the, uh, the action that happened out here. Now directly behind me here is one of but a few monuments that are actually out here on the field for Battle of Gaines Mill. And it kind of makes you wonder why there's so few markers for such a significant place. This battlefield was, at the time, the second largest battle um, at that time during the Civil War, Shiloh being the largest battle for casualties. The battlefield itself had about 15,000 casualties at the end of the day. And the frontal assault that took place here about 7 p.m. on June 27th of 1862 actually turned out to be the largest frontal assault of the entire Civil War. General Robert E. Lee had ordered General Jackson earlier in the day to take place in this battle. Jackson ends up lost, sends his troops down the wrong road. Um, they have to countermarch, and it takes them between two to four hours to get back into the position where they're supposed to be. And at that critical moment when the attack happens, Jackson's on line, and the overwhelming forces cause the Union Army to essentially retreat from the position that they were in. And the position was a strong position. At that point, you're looking at about 32,000 Confederate soldiers that are attacking a very strong fortified position with woods in its front and a, and a creek between it. Um, no other battle during the American Civil War had that kind of an attack at any given time. But because the sun was going down and it was getting hard to see and men were getting lost in the woods, the attack fizzled out. Uh, the 5th Corps and the 6th ended up going back across the river and back to safety to fight another day. Behind me is the Sarah Watt House, a widow that lived here at the time of the battle, June 27, 1862. When she came back to the house, she described the house as having all the clapboards riddled with bullet holes, the windows destroyed in the house, the roof with holes punched in it. And she said that there was scarcely a spot on the floor as big as a man's hand that did not bear the stain the dark, deep stain of men's blood on the floor. 
because this house, just like many of the other structures, eventually was turned into a hospital for the wounded men that fell out here at this battlefield. Many farmsteads turned victim to battlefields just like this one. If it wasn't completely destroyed and burned during the battle, it had to deal with the casualties after the battle. And the houses were usually occupied for a long time afterwards, taking care of the wounded men. Uh, Sarah Watt was married to an Irish immigrant out here and then was widowed in 1854. And this was her homestead. And it was a typical farm with several hundred acres of land that she had to take care of. Now as I walk out towards one of the artillery positions here at the battlefield, um, we'll talk about how all of this came about. So not too long before this battle, Robert E. Lee actually takes over the army that would become known as the Army of Northern Virginia. And McClellan, deciding that he was going to have to move his men to a better position, or what he deemed to be a better position, decided to retreat and go back towards the James River. So his most trusted man, Porter, he tells him to take his 5th Corps and to be the rear guard for the army so that the army can retreat back towards the river. And Porter does his best. He swings around the side of the army and he takes that rear guard. Well, Robert E. Lee senses blood in the air. He senses the, the chance, the opportunity to do something big. So Robert E. Lee musters up as many men as he can and he runs them up here to this position and telling General Jackson to come from where he's located to join up with the army and fight here at this position. When they swing around to this location, this is one of the rare instances where the Confederate Army is actually outnumbering the Union Army. And it's, it's about 57,000 Confederate soldiers to 32,000-ish Union soldiers out here on this field. And so we have a lot of first times and a lot of different things that happen here that, that don't typically happen in most of the battlefields here in Virginia. You have a Confederate Army in superior numbers out, outnumbering a Union Army. You have a Union Army in a superior position that's behind a wooded location. And you have an entire other branch of army that's sitting across a river that can come in for full support, um, but the support comes in almost too late. Uh, and then General Jackson has another incident that like he had in other previous incidences where he's sent his men either to the wrong location or he's gotten into a position to where he's being roadblocked by one thing or the other. And it all comes to a head here at Gaines Mill and the, the battle that takes place here is vicious. At the time in 1862, it was the second bloodiest battle in all of the Civil War, with Shiloh being the bloodiest battle. So we'll walk through the, the Confederate attack that comes out here. We'll go down to Bosun's Creek and see that location. I'll take you out to the open field towards Gaines Mill where the Confederate location was for their staging. And where I'm standing right now is an artillery position on a hill, and this would have been one of the key locations for the Union Army, and they would have been placed out here from my left to the right. Now the walk out here is not that bad. Um, it's a beautiful field and a very, very well preserved location. If you want to get a sense for what an actual Civil War battlefield would have looked like, Gaines Mill is one of those rare locations where you can go and still see the terrain for the way it used to look. Especially here with the old historic home behind us and the fields and the woods still in pretty much the same shape that they would have been back then. The only difference is these woods, after the battle, directly after the battle, the large trees that were in here were either fell over uh, by the soldiers that were in place or they were riddled with bullet holes. So you can imagine this place was pretty much destroyed after the battle. But over time, the trees have come back. 
and so we have the field looking the way it is. And it's not developed, thankfully, so preservation uh, wins the game today. So like we said earlier, the 5th Corps was retreating eastward and when they got to this location they decided to set up shop and it was about a, a two mile line essentially they were looking at uh, from left to right. And if you can imagine a straight line in front of you, then Porter's line swings like a door over to the right hand side so it's setting at a different angle and it's supposed to screen the army's movement so that the Union Army can make its way to the James River. The key component here for Robert E. Lee is he realizes that the 5th Corps has its back to the Chickahominy River. So he comes up through here knowing that there's going to be a, an instant barrier for that army and its movement away from this position. And that's why he attacks him here and gains his mill. Now hopefully you can kind of tell um, the direction of everything by looking behind me. But this ridge that stretches in the direction directly behind me here is sitting at the top of a hill. And it wraps its way all the way around through there. The Union Army actually set itself up here. John Fitz Porter's men set itself up in a direct line. And actually, that sign behind me probably does a better job of explaining how the men are lined up. If you can see that sign directly behind me there. And we'll see if we can't put the picture up here so you can see it too. But this is where they're set up. And he's set up in a pretty dominant position, being here on the hill with a creek off in this direction here behind me. The Confederates are coming from that direction. Texas is actually coming from that direction. Um, the Texas Brigade's first real engagement that gives them that legendary status for the Confederacy is coming from that direction and does the breakthrough down here at the hill. And then up here um, you have units such as the 1st Pennsylvania whom I'll talk about one of their members uh, here shortly but the like the 1st Pennsylvania, New Jersey and uh, some New York m uh, members are out here at this field and they're the reserves that are sitting up there on the hill too. This battle is one of the rare battles where everybody is in. There is no reserve that's left behind. You're talking both sides are putting every single person into this battle to fight. And the outcome is pretty catastrophic for both sides. The number of casualties is massive here. For a six hour period of fighting, there is over 15,000 casualties missing, wounded, or killed here on this field in such a small two mile stretch. It's pretty amazing what happened here. So nature has given us a good opportunity here and uh, you never waste an opportunity. This tree here has naturally fallen over time and it stretches all the way down um, and it goes a long way down. Now. At the time of the battle, they were actually chopping trees down and letting them land in that direction so that the tops of those trees would act as a barrier. The soldiers that were coming up from that creek area would have to go past these trees and end up tangled and they couldn't do the Napoleonic style warfare like you see with the lines of men at Gettysburg and stuff like that. So they were getting tangled up and lost and then you add in the fact that the sun was going down. Um, it was starting to get darker in these woods, a lot darker than it was across those open fields that we're about to walk on here in a minute. And they would chop these trees down and, and, and make them fall down so that they would create that barrier. Plus, sometimes in battle, cannonballs and actual musket fire would actually riddle the tree to the point to where a tree would actually topple over too. And it would gnar gnarl it down to basically what looks like toothpicks coming up out of the ground.
Now, out in these woods, there are some areas um, that look like depressions in the ground. Looks like, sort of like a creek might have been there or a large tree fell down. Um, and I'm standing in front of one of the, such places just like that. It's by, been identified by park rangers that these are actually lengthy burial pits where soldiers would have been buried and then dug back up in 1866 to be reinterred at another, um, to be reinterred at a cemetery essentially. Um, out here on this field, there was many men buried out here during the battle. And as a result, scars are left in the ground after that. Now over time, the dirt has filled back in so the pits aren't quite as large as they were. Plus with traffic, foot traffic, people going back and forth and people seeking uh, mementos from the battlefield, uh, that, that leads to the erosion of those pits. But you can barely make out the depression right here in the, in the ground running in this direction. And, and that's what we're talking about, is that small depression in the ground. There would have been about four or five soldiers, maybe more, buried in this location right here. And they would have been out here until roughly 1866 when they were pulled back from the earth to be buried properly in a cemetery. Now when you come out to the field, you're going to see signs saying uh, Griffin's Woods. That's what the, the dubbed name for this location is, is Griffin's Woods. Um, at the time of the battle, uh, these woods that I know of did not have a name. Uh, this, this was named Griffin's Wood after Charles Griffin. In this very location where we're at today, there would have been 16 different brigades that actually fought out here in this condensed area. Um, and here in a second, I'll show you Bosun's Creek. It's probably one of the better scenes of the creek itself. It's flowing right behind me here. Hopefully you can see that back there. You kind of see the water sparkling right there. That's the actual Bosun's Creek that we're talking about when we talk about the, the creek that the Confederates came across and the fight that happened uh, back and forth. Again, this is uh, Griffin's Woods out here at Gaines Mill. Now I have the luxury of walking around with a nice hat and a thick jacket on because it's nice and cool out here today. And as you can tell by looking at the foliage, it's fall and the, the leaves are falling and the colors are changing. It's a beautiful day to be out here at Gaines' Mill. But at the time of the battle, we're talking June 27th. And if you've ever been to Virginia in June, in the middle of summer, and walked around on any field, or any woods, you know that it's extremely hot. It's a, it's a difficult thing. Um, just imagine you are on that field, you're here in Griffin's Woods, and you're carrying a 15 pound musket, like we're talking about before in other videos. You are loaded down with gear, and you have a wool uniform on. You're just inviting heat stroke, basically. So, the average soldier out here had to deal with a lot of stress and it wasn't necessarily just from combat fatigue. So I'm here at Bosun's Creek and I'm at the very location where Texas broke through. Um, 
And as the story goes, Lee rides up to Hood and says, can you break this line? And Hood says, I will try. And as they get to this position, they charge in uh, with a loud yell and they hit the first line, then the second line, and then eventually it turns into a route. And in another location, um, off to the left-hand side, there was another breakthrough. And of course, there was an argument as to who, who broke through first, um, but this is the location that's pinpointed as the breakthrough, uh, for the first breakthrough, because probably because Robert E. Lee came over here and talked to John Bell Hood about whether or not he could break through the line. Uh, one soldier that was in this area that was wounded from the Confederate side was Lieutenant William D. Roundsville. He actually lost his arm here. Um, and then his brother John was fatally wounded in this location. And they would be only two soldiers of about 250 soldiers that would be killed and wounded uh, in the 4th Texas Infantry on June 27th. Now we talked about uh, bullet riddled trees earlier um, and to tell the story of how something like that happens in these woods I'll give you an estimation. So the three regiments, the 3rd Pennsylvania, 4th New Jersey and the 11th Pennsylvania was fighting somewhere here on the top of the hill within this vicinity. Between those three, in the span of about a couple of hours, they fired more than 100,000 rounds here in this location. That 100,000 rounds is more than enough to riddle a bunch of trees and knock them over. But that just, shows, just goes to show you the type of desperate fighting that happened in this location. Now, I'm currently walking across the location where General Longstreet's men would have charged up the hill. I'm going across a bridge that cuts over the uh, swampy bottom area where the Boatswain's Creek goes through. And in this location, there would have been a very heavy assault that was coordinated along with the other units uh, with AP Hill, DH Hill, General Longstreet, General Jackson, and all their men coming up through this location and here in a minute we'll be crossing that deadly ground um, towards the confederate position from the union position so we will be in the uh the um, america's enemy territory the confederate states now directly behind me here is another one of those burial pits i was talking about where soldiers would have been buried on the field um, there's several of these that are actually out here in these woods. Uh, only a couple of them you can actually easily access. There are a few of them that are pretty, pretty deep in the woods. Out on this vista, um, directly out in front of me here, we have Gaines Mill off in this direction over here. We have the Confederacy lining up in this direction from end to end. And if you look off in the distance over there, you can see that statue to Mississippi that we were just at not too long ago, right across that field directly in front over there. And that field is the field where General Pickett fell wounded. This wide open field is as much like it was back in those days. This was a farm field. The woods directly in front of me here is actually the Griffin's Woods that we were talking about earlier that did not have a name at that time. The men from the Confederacy came out from those woods over there and formed up in line, just like at Gettysburg, and marched across this field, down the slope of that hill, into those trees, 
up a hill and across a creek and then up a uh, steep embankment on the other side where the Union soldiers were trying to make their last stand. It was a very desperate attempt, but off in this direction over here, the Texas Brigade was able to punch through and John Bell Hood's men were able to make a hole in that line and create panic with the Union soldiers who then had to flee back up the hill. Somewhere out in this location was the artillery from Massachusetts. And when the Confederates broke through here at the top of this hill and came out past those woods, the artillery poured fire into the Confederate soldiers, trying to prevent them from overrunning their location and from taking this field by storm and sweeping down the lines. Um, it momentarily paused the Confederates from coming on to this position real strong. but. Either way, the Union soldiers had to retreat. They didn't have a choice. A lot of them were actually running out of ammunition while they were fighting out here. One such soldier would go on to write a book, um, and his name was John W. Urban. Now, for some of you out there, you probably recall his name from Andersonville, because he was a prisoner in Andersonville, and he wrote about his experiences there. But he also penned another book, that I picked up not too long ago in an antique store. And it talked about his journey in the Union Army as a soldier with the 1st Pennsylvania Reserves, Company D, and the different battles that he was in and the fact that he was actually a prisoner of war three times. Here at this field, he states that when the Confederates came on, that he looked around to one of his comrades, his buddies, and he said to them, now look out for the Bull Run Stampede. He was already expecting the men just to go pouring off the field because at that point that was kind of his experience as to what he had had before. And then he witnessed something pretty unique and he wrote about it in his book. His commanding officer, Colonel Roberts, had formed up his men as best he could and they'd run out of ammunition. And then one of the officers that were in charge came across him and yelled at the officer and said, can you stop those men from, from running? And he yelled back, I'm trying, I'll try, I'll do everything I can. When that happened, Porter actually came up to the position and yelled down at Roberts, can you form your men up and stop those men from running? And he yells back to, to Porter, I'll try but can you give me, gunfire in the distance, but can you give me, uh, can you give me ammunition to stop the enemy? So it shows you kind of the desperate situation that they were in. Not only are they trying to prevent their men from running off the field so that they can continue to fight here in this position where I'm at right now, but John W. Irving, Urban is actually watching his, his commanding officer fight with other officers on the field as to what to do to stop the stampede and to stop it without ammunition. No bullets in the guns, no gunpowder, and the men are standing there doing everything they can. And by the time that they did actually stop the stampede, because those officers were able to form up lines and slow it down, the Confederates come pouring out of this, this, these woods over here directly at them. And then, at that point, the only thing that they can do is run. They have to turn around and save what's left of their men. And eventually, they get across the Susquehanna and they're able to get over to safety to the other side. The nighttime comes on and it prevents the entire Union Army from being rolled up. But that's just one of many of the accounts that happened out here with John W. Urban.
This battle at Gaines Mill was Lee's first actual significant victory during the Civil War. And it shifted the strategy of the Army of Northern Virginia from being one to rest itself on protecting Richmond to being the aggressor in the field. Um, up until that point, General Johnson had been in a defensive mode trying to protect the capital city. But when Robert E. Lee comes along and presses the army here that's in much superior numbers across the entire area for the Peninsula Campaign, the Seven Days Battles, the name of the game is aggression. The Confederate Army is pressing and attacking at every point that they can. And they're pushing the Union Army back further and further. George McClellan, who is a very well-trained officer and very good at training other soldiers, seems to have lost the taste for battle and bloodshed. And here at Gaines Mill, it's just another instance of where a superior army doesn't use all of its resources and loses yet another battle. Eventually, George McClellan, the Union Army, is backed up to the James River, Malvern Hill takes place, and the Peninsula Campaign's over. It results in, ultimately, a Confederate victory overall as they are able to maintain the capital city and move the Union Army out of the position that they're in. Unfortunately, the property behind me here is private property, so I can't go walking out there and checking out the fields. But directly behind me, running in this direction here, in the same direction as Woods, off in the distance would have been the Chickahominy. And then Boson's Creek is over in this direction, feeding in that, in that direction over there. Now, right about here, off in the distance, if you were here at that, that day and time in 1862, you would have actually seen a Confederate balloon in the air, and also Union balloons are out over here in this direction. So the first instance of uh, really military aviation happened out here. The balloons are put up in the air for observation, and so they would go put those balloons up there to have officers up there with spyglasses, and they would witness the movement of the troops and count the amount of flags to determine the troop movement and how many troops were in the area and then report that down to the officers below who would then disseminate the information out to the rest of the army. That is the uh, first real aviation structure really in, uh, in the army at that time. And eventually in the future we would go on to have an aviation command, actual airplanes that fly and now the largest aviation uh, community in, in every military aspect you could think of. Now, I'd be sadly mistaken if I didn't mention some of the heroics that happened out here on this field and some of the names that come to mind in the uh, Union Army or the United States Army. And there were a total of seven Medal of, Medal of Honor recipients for this battle. Just to name a couple that stand out, um, John Henry Moffat earns a Medal of Honor out here for distinction uh, and for heroism. He later on becomes a member of Congress in the United States. Then you have Ernest Vaughn, I'm probably going to mess this up, Vegesack, and he is a Swedish immigrant. Eventually he goes back and becomes part of Parliament. And last but not least, one of the names I want to mention is good old Dan Butterfield. Now, Dan Butterfield is an officer in the United States Army, and he's most noted for coming up with taps, the, uh, the long trumpet sound that's played at funerals um, for all soldiers that have passed away. And uh, it's used today in ceremonies and it was widely, widely regarded as a nighttime um, part of the process for the United States Army at the time. They would play that in the evenings right before it was time for the lights to go out. And eventually, it evolves into a soldier's final lullaby. And uh, all soldiers, sailors, Marines, 
airmen and reservists that are buried with honors are buried to the sound of taps. Now, as mentioned before, Dan Butterfield received a Medal of Honor. And I'm in the position right now in this uh, big, beautiful set of woods where Dan Butterfield supposedly had the act of heroism that created the reason for him receiving a Medal of Honor. He was in charge of a unit out here that was being attacked and men were fleeing left and right. And as he's out here in this position, he's rallying men. He's rallying men that are fleeing and he's, he's positioning them here and trying to have a stronghold that's actually fighting against the Alabamians. And because of his efforts, this end of the line, which is almost completely encircled by Confederate soldiers, ends up standing its ground and not fleeing at that moment in time. It was reported up line and for his acts of heroism and leadership here at this field in the exact location where I'm standing right now, he was awarded the Medal of Honor. Now the marker directly behind me here is a marker dedicated to uh, Wilcox's Alabamians. And the marker itself details exactly what happened in this location. And it claims that the Alabamians spearheaded the breakthrough here at this location where I'm standing today. And of the 1,850 men that were involved with Alabama, uh, 600 of them were casualties here at this battlefield, according to the sign behind me. It's another one of those um, massive casualty situations for a unit and a monument placed here of very few monuments that are on the field. Interestingly enough, the majority of the monuments that I see out here, markers, are dedicated to Confederate units and not Union units. But the signs around here detail the whole story and tell exactly what happened from, from both sides of the story. So as you can see that bridge behind me there, that goes across the Bosun's Creek that I was talking about earlier. And I uh, just came back from that big open plateau that I just took a uh, video of to describe the battle. And what I'm about to do now is go up the hillside where that breakthrough happened with the Texas Brigade out to the open field towards the Watt House. I'll take you along with me here. The position I'm in right now is where Longstreet's men were to come up through here. And uh, I'm actually going up the hill itself towards the location where the monument is, marking Whiting's position, just before you get to the Watt House Road um, where the snake rail fence is. This uh, location is pretty difficult to get through when you're in a brigade of men marching through here and trying to come up through here closer to nighttime. It's dark and there's a lot of trees, a lot of underbrush, and um, a lot of things that are in the way. Thankfully for us here today, there's clearly marked paths. The brush is cut back. The trees are cleared out of the way for us. And it makes for a really good hike. And so it's a good time out here learning about history at the Richmond National Battlefield Park here at Gaines's Mill.
Now there is cavalry out here, and uh, Jeb Stewart is out here, and he's fighting in this battle here at Gaines Mill. But another person that's out here is Jeb Stewart's father-in-law, Brigadier General Philip St. George Cook. And he's actually fighting them and trying to prevent the cavalry from coming around the other side and uh, sweeping in from the flank. It's a pretty interesting situation that your father-in-law is out here and you're having to fight against them and vice versa. I'm sure that the, the daughter was definitely on pins and needles when these battles were taking place. Now coming out of these woods, directly in the position behind me, I would have had Longstreet. And over in this direction would have been Hood. And if you look behind me over here, the Union position over there is Griffin. Martindale. And then directly behind me over here in that set of woods is Butterfield. And this comprises a section that we're in today called Griffin's Woods. Um, and like I said earlier, Griffin was named, the uh, woods are named after Charles Griffin, who commanded the unit this directly off in this direction over here. The cannons, that area over there where I was at when I talked about the artillery and the fighting that took place here. Now, there were a series of photographs that were taken out here on this field too. And this is June 27th, 1862 when the battle took place. There were a series of photographs long after the battle that actually shows the soldiers exposed, the ones that were buried out here at the field. And you can see bones sticking up out of the ground, two and three skulls stacked together side by side where the bodies were hastily buried and then placed in shallow graves. And over time, over the couple of years that they were out here, the um, dirt washes away. The erosion happens naturally and sometimes hogs come out and root the bodies up and eat away at the bodies too. So we'll put some of those photographs up here um, to show you some of the historic photos of this location too to talk about how photography itself has shaped the landscape. And without photography at that time, talking about the battles and displaying this, the public doesn't have a full understanding of the carnage that takes place during this battle. Um, a lot of that's true even in today's society. Without the media, without the video footage coming from some of the terrible situations that are happening in the world today, people don't understand exactly what, what's happening on the ground. And even when they see it with their own eyes, they question it as to whether or not it's the truth. Um, certainly the photographs taken on these fields was the truth. Just like many of the photographs and videos around the world are the truth today. It's been a great time coming out to uh, Gaines's Mill, displaying the battlefield for you, taking you on a tour out here, showing you around. I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope that you'll tune in in the future and click subscribe like and hit that alert button for the next few videos that are coming up for now this is history with waffles and i hope you have a good day